Well, thank you, Ken. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight. And I'd like to thank you and the entire Institute for the very warm welcome and wonderful Southern hospitality I've gotten. I was actually wondering, um, Ken had told me that um, several hundred people had signed up to come tonight, and I was wondering why the heck you would want to come here and listen to me this evening. Then I tasted the hors d'oeuvres, and now I get it. <laughs> <laughs> So I'd like to talk a little bit tonight about um, cybersecurity, and that's been a big issue in the paper. It's been written about a lot lately. It's becoming more and more on the screen. It's something that I think is going to affect our country a lot. So hopefully I can um, help you uh, understand a little bit more about it. I promise I won't do any advertisements tonight, but as Ken mentioned, I am part of General Dynamics. I uh, run an organization within the information um, systems and technology. Um, but what that organization does, and, and why I know a little bit about this, um, my guys don't let me design anything anymore, so I'm obsolete as an engineer. But, I, um, but we do um, serve the country. The Defense Cyber Crime Center, which is where uh, the nation sends all the computers it finds and all the hacks that come in to be um, the forensics to be done to solve those issues and, and push them back out, the solutions back onto the network. Uh, we run the U.S. CERT contract, which is the Cyber Emergency Response Team, uh, which is all the attacks that come into the .gov network, uh, which is how, which is the um, the nation's network for our government to use, uh, where it passes information back and forth among the agencies. In addition to that, uh, I've spent most of my life uh, working with intelligence agencies and doing a lot of things I can't talk about, but it's given me a little bit of insight uh, into this particular problem and challenge that the nation has. Uh, also, as Ken mentioned, I'm part of the Defense Science Board, and I'm honored to be able to volunteer some time uh, with that group. Um, but I would like to let everyone know, specifically if there's any reporters in the room, that um, tonight I'm speaking for myself and not representing the Pentagon or the board. So adversarial innovation. You know, when, when we talk about cyber, um, we're, we're talking about a case where um, it's a cat and mouse game, and it's you against the adversary, and it, it's never over. Um, so the more you learn about cyber vulnerabilities, the more you worry. Um, so tonight I want to educate you so that I'm not the only one worrying, and I can help you worry as well. <laughs> and, and ultimately, I think our goal is to build public awareness um, across our private and public sectors uh, to address this threat as a nation. So it's not something that um, we have, you know, you hear people talking about cyber Pearl Harbors and the nasty things that can happen to us. And I think our job as a country is to take the work up front and not to make sure that doesn't happen to us as a nation. So a little bit of background. Um, this has been brewing for a while. Um, you know, in the work that I've done for the intelligence agencies, I've known things for the last, you know, 15 or pushing 20 years um, that only started showing up in the newspapers a few years ago. And a former um, head of our um, director of national intelligence, Mike McConnell, who's a friend of mine, uh, actually, if several years ago, after he retired from that position, he went on the offensive, um, writing op-eds in newspapers, and you can see one of those here in the Washington Post, trying to get the nation's attention. That, um, that we have a real problem here and it's something the country needs to deal with. And the way he described it was we are fighting a cyber war today, and this is three years ago, and we're losing. Um, basically, the fact that the U.S. is the most connected com country on Earth, that we do our banking by cell phone, we um, fill our gas tanks, <laughs> often uh, with logistics that happen through um, I information networks. We do our war fighting. Uh, if we learned anything in Iraq and Afghanistan, it's by hooking all of our systems together and networking them. We can pass sensor data back and forth, and we can address adversaries in real time that used to take us hours or days to do. And when you were dealing with adversaries that were these small terrorist groups, um, they tended to be very nimble. They tended to move around a lot. And if you couldn't address those threats in real time, you couldn't be very effective. All those things we've learned and we've gathered strength from have also become a bigger weakness because by hooking all these systems together, um, we have let adversaries who can get into our systems have access to much more of them sitting in the basement in bunny slippers, for lack of a better term, um, for things that they used to have to go try to infiltrate our, our physical systems and break into our systems to do. Uh, the stakes are enormous, as, as Mike says, and, uh, because this touches not only defense, it touches everything. It touches our power grid, our water systems, telecommunications, cell phones, banking systems. It's all networked together, and it can all be hacked. And if you are a Wells Fargo customer, you may have noticed a week or so ago that your system was down for several hours because of some hack attempts that came in and blocked those systems. That's just one of many examples that have been in the press in the last year. 
Uh, you know, some people talk, and since I've done the study for the DSB, um, I've got, talked to a lot of reporters, and a lot of them all come in, and every once in a while you get one that says, well, this is all hypothetical, right? We really haven't had a cyber war. We're really not in this battle. And, and I would say that while we haven't had what I would call a cyber war, I would say we're in a cyber war. We're in an economic war uh, for who's going to be the strongest, who's going to be able to protect their intellectual property and those things they invest in. And for the last years, we've watched much of ours uh, leave the country and um, not in this article, but Mike's also been quoted in public um, stating that he feels, as the Director of National Intelligence and a person who really ought to know, that um, the transfer of wealth that has happened over the last decade from cyber losses to this country is the biggest wealth transfer in the history of the world. And the President, um, also not a, um, uh, a, an ignorant person, is also one of the first things he did as he stepped into his new role um, back in 2009 was he got briefs around this issue. And uh, his predecessor also understood this issue and set up some of the systems that are actually starting to work today and got that going. But uh, President Obama, uh, literally a uh, few, few months into his term, one of his first major addresses was on cyber. And it was really one of the first times we heard a uh, president talk about this in an open public forum. Cyber is typically done in the dark shadows prior to this. Cyber was something that we did in the intelligence agencies. We spied on each other. We, um, things happened and nobody ever heard about it. And over the last years, with all the um, IP theft, with all the actions that have happened, with more and more press, and you've seen that building over time, and if you've watched this week, um, you've actually seen our chairman of the Joint Chiefs uh, over in China actually in public pressing the Chinese to fess up and um, work with us and help solve this problem and not be part of it. That's a huge step forward for our administration and for the country and something that, quite frankly, um, a number of people have wanted to happen for the last decade and we just hadn't gotten that far yet or realized the importance of it. So President Obama, in this speech early in his first administration, um, talked about uh, intellectual property losses a year estimated at $1 trillion. It's a pretty substantial part of world GDP. And one of the things he talked about was the fact that we have no cyber um, policy or strategy as a country uh, that organizes our organizations that are all dealing with this. If you were in the defense side, and I'm sure many of you here either um, are in the defense side or you had that in your history, um, cyber became the new way to get money three or four years ago. So the Air Force was announcing the, ability, the, the desire to build cyber airplanes, and we had everybody tack cyber onto whatever they were doing trying to get budgets. But we had everybody off on their own. You know, everybody was off on their own. We didn't have a coordinated effect, and we still quite aren't there, but, but it's being worked very hard and we're gaining uh, much traction. And the President said status quo is no longer acceptable, and while this is a slow process, uh, working through our bureaucracies and our large infrastructures we have in the U.S., I think we are making progress. So while I hope to scare you tonight, I hopefully I'll also give you some hope that the country is doing some very good things um, through the government and our administrations. So how did this all start? Well, it all started with the, the creation of this little thing we call the Internet. And an old engineer, uh, or at least he's old now, a communications engineer named Robert Medcalf, um, some number of decades ago, uh, came up with a theory that the, as you add more components to a network and network more pieces together, um, you don't just gain linearly by the number of components you add to that network. You actually gain by the square. So the network becomes more and more valuable as you add more pieces to it. And we've seen that grow. We've seen the network start slow um, back in the 80s, and we've seen it blossom and grow into a key part of almost everything we do. I'm sure if I ask a poll, I would find almost every person in this room is tied into the Internet in some form or another. And um, your kids are all better at it than you are. So the next generation will, uh, will just use this as a matter of course. Of course, the problem with that is we built a great capability um, that's provided wonderful things. I mean, I, a friend of mine is the head of acquisition at the National Security Agency, and every once in a while she and I go out for a drink and kind of talk about things of life. And um, usually about once a year we'll look at each other and she'll say, do you do internet banking? And I'll say, yeah, I do. How about you? And he, yeah, I do. And we're hiding the law of large numbers because it's so easy and so effective, but we also know it's very risky. Um, because security was not built into the internet, and it's very hard to add it on later on. It's given us great advantage, though. We're not going back. And our warfighters especially have learned this in Iraq and Afghanistan. By hooking these systems together over the last decade, we've been able to do missions that used to take us from the time frame you would get a sensor hit that you had a target in an area. It might take six to eight hours, if you look back just six or eight years ago, uh, to be able to put a weapon on a target. Today, we can do that in minutes 
and it's because of the extreme um, connectivity and the wonderful work that our soldiers have done in the theater. There's no going back, so how are we going to deal with it? Well, if you've ever built a system before, if you've ever built a house and you decide to go back and put security in later, it always costs more, and it's always harder because you're doing it as an afterthought. And, and that's where we're at right now, and that's what I think over the last few years the country has started to deal with and started to put in place. Um, you know, security is a pain, right? You, we would rather not have to use it. It costs money to add it. You got to buy an application. You got to give McAfee 50 bucks a year. You know, how dare them? Um, it limits functionality. You know, your cell phone doesn't work quite as fast to download the latest app or look at the YouTube video your kids sent. And it increased costs because those things don't come for free. As I went through and did the study, um, for the Defense Science Board uh, a few years ago. It was amazing uh, of the ignorance I found in some of the very senior level people in the DOD, and ignorance that I don't think is there today. I think they've made tremendous progress in the last few years. But I actually had one person with a lot of stars who I will not identify actually tell me, son, how many people have died from cyber attacks? <laughs> as, as opposed to this isn't that important. And I tried to explain to him how if your weapon could fire at you instead of the enemy, you would probably think that was more important. And that's what we're talking about here. And uh, at that point, we started a more con uh, productive discussion. <laughs> But as we've added IT systems to our weapon systems, it's interesting. We've always created IT. Is all, IT has always been about efficiency. Tie everything together, do it as cheap as possible. And the guidance that the CIOs have been given is don't cost me any more money, but give me more connectivity. And we've seen Moore's Law drive the cost of routers, telephones, all those things that were very expensive decades ago have become very cheap. And we've gotten great benefit. But we've hooked all these things to our weapon systems. When we build a weapon system, we test it nine ways to Sunday, for lack of a better term. Um, we are very careful that that weapon system can't be corrupted, that we control that weapon system. And now we've taken that weapon system, we've gone through all these controls on it, we've now tied it to a system that was given to the cheapest equipment by the lowest bidder with no security designed into it, and at times we're surprised that we have an issue. And we shouldn't be surprised. And clearly, this lack of defense uh, puts our public and military capabilities at risk. And I'll, I'll try to give a few examples of that as we go through the talk. Um, if Willie Sutton were around today, Willie would be in his basement in bunny slippers uh, after taking a couple IT courses, and he'd be hacking on the internet. Because there's a lot more money, as you can see from the chart today, in stealing money from the banks on the internet than there is in showing up with sticks of dynamite and, and pistols in your pocket. And it's a lot safer, too. Uh, at the same time, you know, whenever you have something to protect from the dawn of time, somebody else wants it and somebody else is going to go after it. And whether that's gold back in the um, early days of the Roman Empire, whether it's trying to intercept messages in the Pony Express, um, you know, some people want to take short steps to get wealth and skip the process, and we're always going to have to deal with those people. The difference is the internet has let those people do it from the basement of their house in many cases. And uh, it's reduced their risk, it's increased ours. So the study I mentioned, and this is actually available on the internet, there's a classified version that uh, most of you probably can't get a hold of, but the unclassified version is available on the Defense Science Board <coughs> website. And, um, and we had a wonderful team that got to work on this. Um, former directors of the National Reconnaissance Organization, National Security Agency, um, a number of very smart engineers from IBM, Google, um, great places. So it was wonderful. I was asked to co-chair the study. And the team spent literally a year and a half um, really kind of pouring our hearts and souls into this as our night jobs, uh, while we all had day jobs to do as well. And, and we came back and we reported some findings um, back to the Department of Defense uh, and, and to its leadership. And what we basically told them is summarized on this page, and I'll talk some more of it after this, but, you know, first off is the cyber threat's not new. Ever since we've had networks, ever since we've had communications, we've always tried to get in the middle to intercept someone else's communications, and that could have been smoke signals back in the um, dawn of uh, the American uh, territories to um, very sophisticated encryptors and um, Enigma machines in World War II. So this is nothing new that we're talking about. The difference is we've connected everything together now. So the vulnerability, the space at which those adversaries can get to has expanded dramatically um, um, by all the efficiencies that we put into place. And the fact that we're the most connected country on Earth uh, makes us more vulnerable than many others would be in this particular challenge. 
So our critical dependence on these systems, you know, many of our military systems don't work today without connectivity to the internet, or, or at least communication channels. Uh, a buddy of mine that works up at NSA is a pilot, and he flies uh, cargo planes uh, for the military as a reservist now. And he tells a story about when he learned how to fly these planes, and forgive me, I forget which one it is. I'm sure some of you in here probably know that much better than I do. Uh, but basically, it was, it, was a, it was a plane, and they, they trained you how to fly it. Then they trained you how to fly it if this went bad, that went bad, you know, how all the controls could go bad, and you could still manually fly this thing. Then if you got in real trouble and you lost your navigation, there was a window up above the cockpit, and they put a sextant up over top and you pull the sextant down you could navigate by the stars if you were really in a bind. So today, the new version of that plane is fly-by-wire. The manual says if, the, if XYZ parts go out, jump the hell out of the plane because you can't fly it anymore. <laughs> the window's gone, the sextant's gone, and we don't teach navigating by the stars to our um, young sailors and soldiers in the military academy starting a few years ago. So we are more dependent upon these capabilities than we've ever been in the past. And we just need to deal with that as part of how we operate as a nation. What's also happened in the last um, couple decades is the complexity of our software and microelectronics has exploded. <clears throat> when we started building, micro, you know, as a young AT&T Bell Labs engineer, when I was a young pup and didn't know what I was doing yet, I designed the biggest analog chip AT&T had ever done back in the early 80s. I think there was like 10,000 transistors on it. Um, Intel today builds operating systems with 4 billion transistors on it. You're not going to go through and check every one of those to see if anybody's stuck in something you don't want. They have lots of tools to try. And, um, and probably more times than not, we do a great job. But you're just not going to be able to do that. Microsoft, if we look back at their operating systems, even as of 2007, uh, 50 million lines of code in an operating system just to run the basics of your PC to get it turned on so you can use Windows or, or Google or anything else you want to do that adds more complexity. So the days of us being able to go and hand check every piece to make sure it's what we think it is are over because we just can't do that anymore. Uh, it would take too many years and too many dollars. So we have to find other mechanisms. And these life cycles are tied together, and many of these critical components that make these systems work, we buy overseas. And again, doesn't mean it's bad, doesn't mean it's good, but it's, it's outside of our providence, it's outside of our ability to watch quite as closely as we might in the old days. So no network of DoD is untouched by these networks, um, yet the IT support functions still think of these as the cheap part you just do to plug into the network. And our team, um, very carefully, um, these were not words we used lightly, but we went back and told the Secretary of Defense uh, that we lack confidence that our systems would work through a sophisticated full-spectrum attack by a peer competitor. And to put that in English, full-spectrum means someone who uses all their capabilities, not just cyber, but their kinetic and other capabilities. And a peer competitor means you know, not the Flintstones. It means um, like a China or a Russia or somebody who has capabilities and resources like we do. Um, our team is not suggesting we're about to go to war with anyone or we think that's inevitable. Uh, merely looking at the risks that if we had to, we believe our systems would be at risk today. And, and I will try to justify why that is over these next few slides. So the first reason why that is, offense always has an edge over defense. This has been true since the beginning of the time and in cyber it's no different. The offense gets to amass its full resources against whatever it can find as a weakness of the defense. The defense has to try to protect every part of its system. And if the offense tries and fails, it merely looks for the next weakness in the defense and it tries again. The defense has to continue to try to protect its entire system. Whether you're trying to protect a house, Fort Knox, or a cyber system, these principles hold true. And to try to put this in a little bit more context, this is a chart that um, DARPA our uh, research agency and DOD put together a few years ago. And what this shows is the red line is the average size, the average lines of code that attackers had to write to be able to have a, a attack that got into the internet and was successful at breaching systems, stealing your credit card information, your social security number, a military secret. And you can see that the, pretty much over the last 20 years, the sophistication and size of those code packs are about the same. They're about 125 lines of code. Now the defender, as more and more of these attackers are trying to get in because there's money to be had, it's had to get more and more complicated to build a bigger and bigger and bigger and broader defense to try to protect our systems, our McAfee's, our, our, our PC's, our um, enterprise systems for our companies. And you can see that you know, we're up to more than 10 million lines of code and this data is a few years old. I think we'd find that number more in the 25 million um, lines of code today. 
So if you were going to build a company and you wanted to put together business plans, would you rather be on the side that needs to write 20, 125 lines of code to succeed or the one that has to write 10 or 15 million lines of code to succeed? This is a hard problem. And it's a um, problem that's going to continue to challenge us for some time. So to talk about this intelligently, the first thing you need to know is not all cyber threats are the same. Cyber threats run from the bottom, um, which can still be very sophisticated, but think all the way from bored high school kids um, in, in mom's basement with their first beer uh, who are very um, sophisticated trying to hack into a system, um, up through nation states and actors who are primarily spying or intelligence or they're trying to plant time bombs into someone else's system. So if the day ever came where they didn't want those systems to work and they wanted to be able to disable them, they would have a trigger that they could turn on to make those systems not work. And in between, so if you look at this, at the low level, um, we've called this low, medium, and high threats, and we've broken them into two tiers each. And at the bottom level, we tend to look at hackers and cyber patriots. If you read about groups like Anonymous, um, these are groups who want freedom of information. You know, they have a moral standard that's different than our, our lawful standards, and they've decided they don't want any secrets. So they will go in and try to attack groups and, and tend to use um, what we would call tier one and tier two attacks. Not, not, uh, not unsophisticated attacks, but these attacks tend to be broad. They tend to send them out over the broad internet and see how many people they can catch. And then they'll go back and focus on those areas. As you move up the pyramid, it gets a little more dangerous. You start to get into criminal groups and mercenaries, gangs that are organized, gangs that have money because there's a lot of money to be had on the internet. And they want to, and these aren't just, you know, the level one is the Nigerians asking you to please give you your credit card number so they can send you $10 million. Um, but, but now we're getting a little more sophisticated. We're getting people who are sending you emails that look like they're coming from Bank of America. And everything looks right except for maybe one period in the actual top line of, of the address of that system. And they're using this to try to steal data because they want to get money from you, right? They want to steal your money because it's a lot easier than going out and earning it themselves. So this is what they focus on. If you go on the black market today, uh, there are websites that for about seven bucks will sell you a credit card number tied to a name. Uh, I'm probably about a year out of date, but last time I looked it was about 40 bucks if you wanted the social security number tied to that credit card and tied to that name. So think about that and, and as you're doing your online banking to make sure you're keeping track of those accounts and run a paper copy every once in a while. As you get up into the top tier, what you're really talking about now are nation states. You know, this is us wanting to understand um, what's happening in nuclear reactors in Iran or China wanting to understand what our new bomber looks like or pick, pick your scenario. Um, states have always spied. That's part of what they do. There are some differences we see happening now, though, that I'll talk about a little bit. But these are organizations that will use full capabilities. If they can't break into your network, they'll bribe somebody to get in your network. They'll create vulnerabilities in your system, even if your system is otherwise well protected. And they can be very sophisticated. They have lots of resources. And they have lots of time in which to do it. So I'll try to give you an example of, of kind of, of, of some types of these, just to give you a little bit of a feel for it. So level one and two, even though it's the bottom, um, don't think of it as unsophisticated. The big difference on the internet that's different, if I build a bomb and I send a bomb over to you because I don't like you, that bomb hits, blows up, whatever you had and whatever the bomb had, it's all gone now and we start from scratch again at that point. If I send you a cyber attack, that cyber attack may do its thing, but when it's done, that's still sitting there. The other guys can look at it, study it, Maybe they can morph it and re-engineer it and send it back at you. Once these attacks are out in the open, or out in the wild, as we call it, um, everybody can look at them, study them, and there's a lot of smart people out there, and people will start morphing and using pieces of those attacks to use for other means. It's one of the real differences in cyber versus the types of warfare we've typically fought, in most, in, at least in my career. Um, so very sophisticated tools can be developed by other people, but they can be, need low sophistication to use. And these tier one and tier two folks will take advantage of, of um, vulnerabilities inherently in your system because the system's too big to make everything work right, or you haven't patched, you know, you haven't done the last patch McAfee sent to you, so there's a known attack that's out there. And they'll use very sophisticated tools that aren't that hard to use that they can download from the internet. Uh, to try to go after you. And there's some, you know, a, an interesting demonstration here is lots of people will ask, well, can you actually damage anything? Is this just, you know, the, somebody goes out, steals my credit card, charges 300 bucks, and the bank doesn't charge me? There's a lot more to it than that. And um, one of the things I can talk about is back in 2007, uh, the Department of Homeland Security 
out at a DOD, uh, DOE laboratory in Idaho, actually did a test of something we've known could have, we known we could do for a long time, but we'd never actually seen it in public before. Um, and they basically destroyed a generator in a power plant at a national lab as a test to show you could do it. And if you think about how a motor works, right, all motors have feedback loops, that if it gets too hot, if it's running too fast, they have a, a built-in feedback loop to slow it down. It's called negative feedback for those of you that are engineers. So if you can get into that loop, and you can tell it, nope, it's doing just fine, speed up, speed up, you can basically make equipment destroy itself. And this was demonstrated in 2007. Um, we've seen other examples of this happening. Probably most recently, uh, we saw Saudi Aramco, uh, the group out in Saudi Arabia, uh, Arabia uh, the big oil company, um, had 30,000 computers wiped clean and all the data destroyed on the disk. Now, it turned out it really wasn't destroyed. My guys were able to go in and help them recover all of it and show them how they could do that. But the attackers now know that, and next time they won't make that mistake. So you can do physical damage. You can wipe computers out. You can do a lot of things with um, what we would call low-end attacks. Uh, if you remember reading a few years ago, we have all these predators flying in the Middle East um, that are taking surveillance, that are carrying weapons. And uh, it turned out we hadn't bothered to encrypt most of those. So for a $15 um, Radio Shack trans transceiver, you could basically um, listen to all the commands that were going back and forth and watch the video. So this is literally happening in caves tied into batteries for the people that we were trying to catch for a while. And, and of course, we learned that they figured out how to do that. And we went back and encrypted our piece and got better at our end. And, and they're looking at the next piece on their end. This is always a cat and mouse game back and forth. You've seen a lot of blocked websites. Um, I mentioned Wells Fargo. You know, Amex was taken down a few weeks ago for several hours. JP Morgan's had trouble for a few days. Just, these are just in the last few weeks. Many of these have shown up in the press. And um, the real take, you know, those are more the obnoxious ones because they're trying to cause problems, but they're really not stealing things. They're, they're blocking in a company's ability to operate. They're costing them money. But the real harmful ones are when they can actually steal your personal identification, sell that to other people that will then try to use that to steal your assets or steal secrets, proprietary information. You know, if you're Gulfstream, a company in my organization, and you sell half your jets in China, the last thing you want are your plans of your jets showing up in China companies that would like to copy that. So we're very interested in being able to protect that kind of data. Companies like Caterpillar and others are very interested. And if you look at these, a uh, few of these examples, um, you know, TJX, uh, about six, seven years ago, lost more than 60 million credit cards. Um, Google, you, everybody read the um, Google China issues that showed up a couple years ago. Heartland was a, a company that recently lost a few, uh, several tens of millions, actually it might have been 100 million um, credit cards by having their servers breached. And you've probably seen some other interesting things. Um, you can think beyond networks now. Let's think about the car. You're driving a car that ties into OnStar? Well, this is an a item that showed up in the press a few years ago where they were able to turn on the microphone, listen to what you wanted. They could change the temperature, um, disable the brakes, uh, change the accelerator. And if you look at the, the actual picture I threw on there, you can see the car thinks it's going 140 miles an hour. It's in park. <laughs> Now, this is, is funny to look at as long as it's not your car and as long as it's not your pacemaker. So as we think about medical devices and all the things that we're putting in electronically that make our lives better, again, if we haven't designed security in at the beginning, then we're in for trouble later on. So now as we get to a more sophisticated attack, you've probably all read in the newspaper over the last year about um, Skucknex, which is a um, very sophisticated attack, uh, but still an attack taking taking advantage of inherent vulnerabilities in networks. And this actually was aimed at the um, nuclear centrifuges in Iran. And it went in, it basically made them spin too fast, and you know, depending on which report you believe, thousands of them destroyed themselves. Um, this would work on lots of other kinds of equipment. It's out in the open now. So again, we're just into the middle level now, um, but we're still seeing some pretty sophisticated, some pretty damaging attacks. And to get into the top level, uh, when we talk about the nation states, now most of what we do in this area is very classified, but we had a very interesting one that got declassified a few years ago, and I think it's a great example. So put yourself back in time and looking at most of you, you know, most of you in here uh, remember the IBM Selectric typewriter. It was the iPod of the day, right? <laughs> It was the most advanced electronic device. Uh, it modernized um, how we did memos, how we did uh, letters, how we handled um, correspondence. And, and, you know, back in that time frame, um, the Soviets uh, managed 
to infiltrate. And as we were sending units out for maintenance and repair, they came back and they had taken a strike bar out. It was just this pure steel strike bar and they had replaced them with a strike bar with lots of little goodies inside. Uh, those goodies for every key strike in the height of the Cold War was transmitted to a transmitter in a wall in that room and then out to a main transmitter and into Soviet intelligence. So in, in our embassy and our consulate, during the height of the Cold War, the Soviet Union was watching every keystroke that we stuck in. Very, I mean, you gotta hand it to them, right? This is pretty clever. <laughs> a lot of work, a very sophisticated attack. Um, we never figured this out on our own. Another intelligence organization stumbled upon it accidentally and tipped us off. Even after they tipped us off, and there's some great um, open source articles that are available now that are unclassified. Even after tipped off, it took us months to dissect this and figure out what it was actually doing. So these attacks, when done well, and by the way, we're pretty good at this too, um, these attacks, when done well, are very, very difficult to find. So with all that as a little bit of background, what's our current state of affairs? Well, the reason that our team came to the conclusion that we should have a little confidence that our systems would work against a peer competitor is first, I've talked to you about the fact that um, we have lots of weaknesses. So we actually put together, and the DOD's done a great job the last five or 10 years of actually putting red teams in place. And those red teams' jobs are to go out and try to break the systems when we do trials. So, so you've got to hand it to the department. Rather than sticking their head in the sand, they're really trying to understand this. And these red teams will send half a dozen to a dozen people out. They'll get a two-week to four-week head start to, look at, to, to do whatever they can from the outside like an adversary would, although the adversary would have years and probably many, many more people. And then the exercise starts, and these teams kill our systems. These teams aren't allowed to use the good stuff coming out of NSA. They're only allowed to use the tax they can download from the internet. And they're able to bring our systems down. In the beginning, they brought our systems down so quickly that the um, people with stars on their shoulders got really upset and said, you're, you're killing me because I can't run my exercise. So now the teams are more creative. Now instead of bringing the system down, they do little embarrassing things to let them know that they've got them, but they still let the exercise run. So you know, maybe you're running a carrier and you happen to let, uh, have a signal coming in on the rudder that they'll let you know maintenance activities and now we can take over the rudder and turn it one direction. So you're gonna spin in circles instead of getting to the war. Um, there's many examples. Most of them are, are not unclassified. Um, but bad things are happening, and what I would simply ask you to think about is if we have six to 12 smart guys given two to four weeks, um, PLA-6 in China, we believe, has 10 to 50,000 people, depending upon the reports that you listen to, and they're not the only ones in the world um, that are gearing up. How good do you think they are? And even if you think we're better today, um, for the levels of spending that are probably higher than ours, in the future, they're going to be better. So this is something we have to wrestle with as a nation. We can't stick our head in the sand and assume these things don't exist. Then when you put on top of that the fact that cyber attacks over the last decade have breached most of our defense systems. Most of our DOD systems, um, the DOD will admit uh, in the right forum that have been breached. Those plans are out, adversaries have them. And what's even more important, not just the plans, but how we actually operate the systems. You know, it's one thing to steal the plan for how we design a GPS, and maybe you can figure it out, maybe you can. It's certainly helpful. But how we use it, and through all the billions and billions and all the experience and all the lives we've lost and how we've decided what decisions need to be made by a person and which ones can be automated, it's how we operate those systems. Our training is really the difference, I think, that separates the United States. It's not just technology. It's our, our men and women in service are, are second to none in, in how we operate and how we train. And those TTPs, um, Tactics uh, procedures are out there too. They've also been breached. So the adversaries have those. We don't understand a lot about what the adversary knows or what they can do from a cyber intelligence standpoint because we haven't spent that much time looking at it. We're starting to. Um, but face it, we spent most of our time over the last decade looking in the Middle East because we had kids dying there and it was very important. So we've you know, we're shifting back to look at um, potential peer com competitors now, but we hadn't done that in a while. And then back to the point that most of our infrastructure is built with foreign parts. So if you put those facts together, it would be crazy to think that we shouldn't be a little bit worried and we shouldn't be taking actions as a nation. So what does all this mean from the realities of cybersecurity? First, it means I can't guarantee you, no matter who you are in this room, you can't guarantee me and I can't guarantee you that your machine code or, or your system isn't compromised because it's, it's too complicated. I can give you risk levels. I can help you understand it's highly unlikely that it is or isn't, but there's no guarantee. And because of that, nobody really knows how, how secure a particular system really is. 
The good news is our country is really good at solving hard problems like this. We've done it before, we've done it many times. Look at World War II, we came out with this new device called the nuclear bomb. All right, we used it twice, nobody knew what the heck to do with it, how do you defend against it? So, you know, first after World War II, we said, well, we'll shoot down the other guy's missiles when they come in. We didn't have the technology to do that. So we evolved over time into a deterrent strategy that served us very well. Look at commercial air safety. You know, we started 100 years ago or so flying around and, and the next thing you knew, 40, 50 years later, we were flying every which way and we had to build a system that would allow us to do it safely. And, and look at what's been built through the FAA, through the airlines, through regulations, through operations. You can say whether it's efficient, good or not, but it's probably the safest way to travel in this country that we have. And if you ignore sequester, it, it often works on time, but not lately. <laughs> And more recently, a probably more contemporary example is the counter IED problem. Um, when our kids started getting blown up, our young soldiers over in Iraq and Afghanistan, it wasn't because the other guys were sophisticated, it was because they were highly adaptive. So, you know, they would go out and do something to us, we would try to fix that, then they would just change and do something else. And we had to change how we operate. We had to operate in a system of system fashion to be able to be, counter those threats and be able to protect. And, and if you look at the statistics over the last years, we've gotten monument, orders of magnitude better at being able to predict and keep our soldiers from being killed by IEDs. Cyber is going to fall into that same category. You can't solve it, but you can manage it. And we have that capability as a nation. So our team came through and we recommended a few strategies um, for the secretary and for his team. The first one is, as I've said, since you can't completely deter everybody because it's just too hard, there's too much sophistication, offense has too big of an advantage, then you better have a deterrence in effect still. And um, with that, we recommended that we continue to protect the, the nuclear deterrent. Now, in saying that, some reporters have come back and said, oh, you said the nuclear deterrent's not safe. That's not what we said. We said, however, that we do need to protect the nuclear deterrent. And the reason is this. We have really not tested it against what I would call that type, that tier five and tier six. We've tested the heck out of it for network safety, for weapon safety, for the ability of someone to hack into the system. Um, they're really well protected systems, but there's some avenues in here that we haven't looked at yet and we should. And I think those things are starting to happen. We need to protect our um, command and communications to those systems and our c continuation of government. It's basically the comms that the national leaders use to talk to each other after a disaster. And those tie into that nuclear deterrent. And then we came up with something that's a little bit new. If you're the president, and you suddenly are in the middle of a cyber war, and maybe your offense isn't working well enough, you would sure like to have something work before you had to use a nuclear warhead um, to get the other person's attention. So we thought you better protect a piece of our conventional weapons, separate some of those from the rest of the herd, unconnect them, uh, connect them differently, put more protection, spend more money on those systems to raise their resilience, and, and ensure that the president always has options um, that, that have multiple levels um, for any situation that would come up. We then said, okay, now that you've, you've done that and you can deter the folks at the high end, there's people at the low end you can't deter, right? You're not gonna deter a terrorist. You're not gonna deter somebody who doesn't have a nation state or has anything you can hold a value. So we have to raise our defenses um, against the low and mid-level threats. But we use the word very carefully to incrementally raise because we don't think you're ever gonna solve it, but we think there's some common sense things that can be done that don't cost a lot of money that make us a lot more capable than we are today. And that includes first, instrumenting the system. You know, what's the first thing we try to do if we're fighting an enemy in the field? We put up systems, we put out radars, we um, send satellites overhead, we try to get reconnaissance and surveillance of the battlefield. Our networks are terrible at doing that because our network's IP was not built in a way that lets us see um, the surveillance and reconnaissance. We don't see the situational awareness of it. So we need to put sensors into our networks that allow us to build that, and those things are starting to happen. We then need to improve our culture. Within DOD and, and quite frankly with the contractor base and everyone else, um, at DOD today, if you're gonna fire a weapon, if I handled, handed you an M16, <clears throat> every soldier knows how to handle it, every soldier takes care of it. If they screw up, they know they're gonna lose their rank or they're gonna end up in the brig. It's taken very seriously. If I give you a secure document, every soldier knows how to handle it. They know if they screw it up or if I screw it up, we're gonna lose our jobs. It's taken very seriously. The number of push-ups a soldier can do is manage on a yearly basis. You have to pass a test to make sure you can do the right number of push-ups. Cyber, you know, we're just not there yet. And the seriousness is starting to come into place, but um, we need our leaders in DOD to make this a readiness issue for leaders and to make it a requirement that we treat our networks as importantly as we treat our weapons, because our, our networks are tied to our weapons. 
And then we said there's some things you need to do to increase the capabilities for both, the high and the low end threat. And the first one of those is as we start to move out of and take some of our focus out of the Middle East, take some of that money that we're spending on intelligence and put it toward um, looking sniffing, hunting for that advanced threat in our network, find them, understand what they're doing, get to know their intentions, get to know their organizations, the way we typically um, work through intelligence activities against any potential adversary. We also need to build a world-class cyber offensive capability, and I think we have one today, but it doesn't scale very well. It's not, it's not big enough for what we probably need. And if you've watched over the past year, you've seen the establishment of Cyber Command um, coming through DOD, and, and just about three weeks ago, they announced they're gonna hire 5,000 cyber warriors over the next three years to populate that command. So I think the um, department is well on its way toward ensuring they have um, this recommendation covered. And finally, um, making cyber part of our DOD acquisition process. We buy a lot of stuff in DOD. It's, it's a difficult process. It's a big bureaucracy. Um, but we need to put these requirements in there. And it doesn't just mean encryption. It means there, there are some other things we can do that will make our systems more secure. So with that, before I get you to, I, I, I do want you to sleep tonight. I just want you to sleep a little more restlessly. <laughs> I would say there is hope. And if you look around, you can see, if you read the newspapers each day, you know, the national debate is underway. And we couldn't say that a year ago, I don't think, in earnest. Today we clearly can. We clearly see signs from the White House and from the DOD that we're addressing this head on. And it's going to take a while. You know, it took a while to build nuclear deterrent. didn't happen two days after um, World War II ended. It took us a decade to develop that strategy and formulate it. And we're going to go through the same process here, but it has started. We put together a thing about seven, eight years ago that the Defense Department set up that brought in the contractors, uh, first the big defense contractors, then expanded to some more contractors um, called the Defense Industrial Base Pilot that basically had all of us watching our networks. And when attacks came in, we shared those <clears throat> results with each other so we didn't all have to be hit by the same attacks. And that has shown great progress. It's been expanded and continues to expand. <coughs> Excuse me. We've also seen the administration, starting with um, the last Bush administration, shift money towards cyber, and we continue to see cyber dollars grow. Uh, I think right now we're struggling with the actual expenditure of those dollars. They're in the budgets. I think we're struggling to spend them with all the craziness around sequestration and, and, not, and our customers not knowing where their budgets are. But the trend's in the right direction, and this is definitely being taken more seriously. And finally, what I think is the, um, the most promising of all is we've seen uh, the DOD stand up actual forces that are going to deal with this threat. Uh, we saw Cybercom, as I mentioned earlier, stand up, and General Alexander, who runs NSA, is, is the leader of that organization as well. And we've seen joint task forces stand up that bring in FBI, intelligence agencies, DOD, Homeland Security, to work together against attacks that are coming into the homeland. And then we've seen the services stand up, and I threw the Navy's 10th Fleet on here because I think the Navy is, is, is an outstanding example of an organization that, um, because of their work in the Pacific and, and having to deal with this threat earlier than the other services did, um, they've really stepped up and are, are very dramatically improving their capabilities. And they've put together 10th Fleet that's, whose job is to deal with cyber warfare for the Navy. But challenges remain. You know, the responsibilities across the government, in my view, are still ill-defined. Even within DOD, we have groups stepping on each other. We have new groups trying to take over uh, charters of other groups, and there still needs to be some coordination. I think progress is being made on the policy side. The other real problem with cyber is we don't have any laws about it. If somebody comes into my house, breaks the window, <clears throat> goes into the basement, gets into my desk, and steals my blueprints for my invention, we have laws to deal with that. If somebody comes in and does that over the Internet, they're stealing the same information, but we really struggle to deal with that as a country. And, we, and quite frankly, it's taken us a long time to get our ire up, and I think it's, it's time we get on with it. And finally, which, and I think equally important, is the debate's only just begun on the tension between privacy and security. Because the way you really manage these things is you look at all the data coming across the network. You, you don't need to un understand the content. You don't need to read people's phone calls, but you need to look at all the data. You need to look for hidden traps. You need to look for malicious code, you need to look for those things that these um, attacks typically form themselves in. And, and that's something that we struggle to deal with now. And we're just starting to wrestle with those issues as to how we're going to look for these threats. So what can we do? And I want to enlist all of you tonight along with myself. The first thing is <clears throat> on our personal devices, we can all make sure we've got some basic protection put on those. 
put the McAfee on it, put you know, Symantec, pick your company, it doesn't matter, they're all pretty good. Um, but if you have a, a PC or a device hooked up in your house to the internet that doesn't have those protections, it was probably had within about 30 seconds of when you plugged it in. So somebody else probably has access to your bank records, whatever you're doing on that device. What's even worse is you've now become a launching point for cyber attacks. When you look at these attacks that happen, uh, people don't just launch from their own server, they take over all your servers that didn't bother putting the protection on and they use your servers as the launch points to have millions of computers attack a, a website all at once. <coughs> so that's something we can all do something about. Second, demand our public servants elevate the understanding of cyber risk and force them to take action. It's really easy for Congress today to say, you know, we can't agree on anything, we're not going to do anything. Well, the heck with that. You know, there, there are some things um, that I think are important enough to the country, they need to be beyond politics, and I still believe that. And I think it's up to all of us to demand that of our legislators. Third, and I'm a business guy, and I really hate government regulation if I don't have to have it because it tends to be slow, it costs a lot, not very effective. But I think it's crazy that we would have water systems, power systems, critical infrastructure in this country operating without any kind of standards and compliance policies required. And there's legislation floating around. Some of it's good, some of it's not so good. But, um, but we need to take action as a nation to protect our critical infrastructures. Because by the way, our military doesn't run without our critical infrastructures either. They last a few days longer than the rest of us. All you have to do is look at one of the storms that have come through and you see one little isolated area that's lost power or water for, for a week or two, and you see the whole rest of the country flooding to help them, and they're still dead for weeks. Now imagine half the country's hit like that, and nobody else can come to their help, and um, the challenges that we would have as a nation. You know, we need to drive the government to make sure they organize and solve these issues of who's responsible for what so we know what to do. And quite frankly, those who are stealing IP, we need to hold them accountable. Why would we hold them less accountable for this than anything else? And finally, and um, I think to the administration's great credit, a couple of years ago, uh, the administration put out a cyber policy, and it basically said in so many words, if you attack us with cyber, we will attack you back. And not necessarily just with cyber, we'll use any means that we have. And I think that's important. Uh, I think deterrence is gonna play a big part of this. If you wanna mess with us, just know you'll be messed back with. Our country's not very good at planning, but we're awfully good at responding. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, if I can leave you with one final note, I'll take you back in history to the 1941 Army-Navy football game. Um, probably less relevant is the fact that Navy won 14 to 6. Probably more relevant is a big argument was going on back in those days. And the argument was whether we should really invest in an Air Force. Uh, and there were, there were people, particularly in the Navy, fighting against that because they didn't think it was going to be that important because no ship, no battleship had ever been sunk by a bomb dropped from air. And how could that possibly be that important? Um, we all know what happened a week and a half later, and we'll never forget that. Um, what I would ask of all of us, and ask us to, to work with our legislators and our government representatives and those who are involved, is let's not make the same thing happen in cyber before we decide to respond as a nation. Thank you. I think we have time for a few questions. Please. There's, there's a microphone coming. The drone that we lost to Iran, can you say anything about that? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Yes, yeah, so I was just curious, uh, do you have any comment or have any knowledge that you can tell us about anything to do with the recent Boston bombing and involvement with technology? Uh, no, I really don't have any insight on that. I really haven't seen any um, cyber ties to, to any of that. We're here. Just wondering if you could speak a little more to the uh, I would say maybe perceived and very real disadvantage that we have as a country where sure. we value our freedoms um, against an adversary like China where the government is basically the state controls everything and they have no obligation to the people whereas, I, you know, like you spoke a little bit about the privacy issue and 
you know, it's it's a difficult proposition, I guess. Yeah, I actually, I, I think it's an advantage and a disadvantage. You know, I think part of what makes this country so great is the fact that we are so entrepreneurial because of the freedoms that we have, and, and those are great things. Uh, the problem is we want privacy, so which which makes it very hard. Um, you know, we have crazy rules today that um, if if a cyber attack's going on internationally, you know, we can watch that, we can do things to block it. Once it comes into the country and hits a U.S. citizen, we can't do anything about it anymore. We have to hand off to another agency. Uh, you know, in China or more controlled economies uh, where they're trying to control the telecommunications, um, obviously they don't have those same restrictions. So they have the ability to control their telecom a little bit differently. They have the ability to control defenses. I would add probably the even bigger issue, you know, they'll have the same weaknesses we have, except um, we are much more connected than they are. And if you look at places like India and others, you know, India, if the power grid goes out, they're used to it. It happens every day. Everybody's got a generator, right? They're, they're used to this stuff just not working. So everybody's got workarounds in place. They've, you know, they've tied into the pyre, you know, illegally to the cable across the street. They all find a way to get by. We're so used to these things working to suddenly be without them. You know, we've lost our um, kind of, um, you know, Western toughness of um, being self-sufficient. We're dependent upon these systems. So because of that, we're not well set to go. So I think our biggest disadvantage is the fact we've just hooked everything together. And we've done that with great efficiency and ingenuity, but because of that, you now have many links. You can you, you can sit basically on a network, and if you can get into the network, you can often get to many more places that you couldn't do otherwise. Sure. It, just another point with regards to um, you know losing uh, maybe our grasp on uh, global infrastructure uh, build up with like China telecom companies kind of undercutting some of our contractors in Europe and stuff like that and getting their equipment maybe where we don't want it. Well, I just heard uh, Huawei actually gave up on the U.S. market a couple of days ago, so I think there's been some interesting um, turns there. I, I think you know every organization tries to compete. Um, I don't have any particular insights or anything that I can really talk about here on on what other groups may be trying to do, but clearly. Uh, if you control the communications infrastructure and you wanted to do cyber attacks, those would be pretty good points at which you could get a lot of information. Uh, behind you. What are the Israelis doing that is perhaps indicative of their superiority in this area? Yeah, the, the Israelis are pretty good. Um, I would rate them, you know, they don't have quite the broad capability that I would say a, a Russia or a U.S. does, but they clearly um, you know, they know how to protect themselves. They've been at war for a long time. They don't take a lot of the, the things for granted that we do, and they're a pretty capable organization. In fact, if you look today at a lot of the commercial technologies that are actually coming into our market, uh, many of those are coming from Israeli companies. Back there. Um, over the last half century, we tried to deal with kinetic warfare with the United Nations after World War II and how to deal with that. And I'm curious today um, how, we're, how the international law is working, or is there any way to do some of this in the, the world court, or is this all just individual nations against individual nations again, and no, no world attempt to no. solve it, like, like we did after World War II? Yeah, no, I think you bring up a, a great point. Uh, clearly, and we're starting to see the call, and you can see the calls that um, Chairman Dempsey's making and others right now in trying to bring China and others into the fold to start to establish norms. You know, uh, everybody used mustard gas and nasty things in World War I, and after that we all got together and said, let's outlaw that. That's, that's too terrible to deal with that. And hopefully we'll be able through um, <coughs> policy and negotiations to work some issues like that through the major country, countries involved with cyber. I would say that those discussions, um, I'm not aware of any deep discussions going on anywhere, though. Uh, I think there is a desire for that. I think there's some early um, indications that you know the U.S. would clearly be interested. Uh, whether some of the other countries are or not, we'll just have to see over time. And in our State Department, I think, is, is trying to work that. Here. You started your lecture off stating that we import our basic parts. Yep. How in the world can we ever accomplish anything unless and until we build our own from scratch? How can we do that? Well, it's a good point. At the same time, I don't know how you go back. 
Um, we don't have those capabilities much left in this country anymore. We, we've sent it all overseas. Um, you know, I think from a manufacturing standpoint, we need to get ahead of the next technologies that are coming in and bring some of those capabilities back. Uh, I think, and the reason we came up with the strategies we did that didn't say, you know, build our own stuff, um, control everything, was because it won't work. You know, it would cost 10 to 20 times more than what everybody's used to buying today. It wouldn't sell economically. The government would be the only buyer. Um, those economic models just don't work. So I think we have to live with where we are today and try to do better things to protect ourselves to make the systems harder to break into. And, and again, I'm a big fan of the deterrent capability and uh, making sure somebody knows they'll get spanked if they come after us. So, so I believe the, the weakest link in our system is probably the home user with a broadband internet connection and no protections on their system whatsoever, running with administrative privileges. What do you think, or what are your thoughts about a mandatory comply to connect, uh, essentially a law that says you can't, your system has to have all these mandatory software protections before you can actually get full internet access? Well, I'll be honest, I think you can do it without that. And there are some consortiums actually working this, trying to get the companies like Microsoft and the builders of the operating systems to build these into their systems. Because face it, we all use the same three or four systems. There's only a few operating systems out there. They're used worldwide. And um, uh, Tony Sager, who uh, is one of the keys out at NSA, has been working with a number of the consortiums with the commercial companies trying to get that to happen. Um, while I'd say that's probably our weakest spot, um, you know, let's... Let's not kid ourselves either. I've had some people uh, on this team even that were part of DOD tell me, well, the real problem is the contractor network. It's not our networks. Well, if you look at these red teams, success at getting into our networks, they can get into the DOD networks as easy as they can get into the commercial networks. Then they say, well, it's the, it's the unclassified networks. The classified networks are really safe. And if you look, and I can't share the details, but the success rate in the classified networks is actually higher at getting into those than it was in the unclassified networks. So we, we can't take for granted that we're really a lot safer than we are under the current structures. And while it's easy to point to one spot that's a really easy target, even the places where we think we're pretty good, and it's not that the architectures aren't good, it's that we accidentally you know, hook the classified stuff up to the unclassified stuff. We have cross-domain violations very regularly, and these are just the ones that we actually know about, not the ones that are happening by accident or somebody's doing stealthily to us. So, so there's a lot of leakage and weaknesses, I think, across many parts of our systems today. Time for one more question. Um, here, you've had your hand up for a while. <laughs> Hi. I was told in a, a senior um, computer class for seniors over 55 that when you are using your laptop computer or some advice, instead of using your desktop computer at home and you go on and you delete some email or something, that it's not really deleted in the cloud. You have to go home and delete it on your desktop computer at home and sign in to you know, AOL and delete it. I'm worried about the cloud. Who owns the cloud? <laughs> Is it ever deleted? <laughs> the answer is no. It's never it's deleted. It's never in the deleted. Cloud. Even, even if they take it off the server, they've got back updates that happen. I, part of my business does forensics, um, where we actually go after um, companies that do these breaches and we help people solve them, and then we actually go back and try to catch the bad guys and, and hopefully ultimately put them in jail. And even when you delete it on your PC, it's probably not deleted. We can probably get it back. Well, so the cloud itself is people own the servers. Um, people have the information, but it's the Amazons, it's whoever you're buying that service from, uh, the telecom company. You know, they put these big server farms that are 50 times bigger than this in large rooms with lots of racks, and, and they need their own little power generator to operate, and they handle billions and billions of these all at once. But just remember, uh, I always tell my people, never put anything in an email you wouldn't want to show up on the front page of the newspaper and have your mom read it, because it's really not gone when you delete it. Uh, it's in a backup tape somewhere, and it can show up to haunt you later on. <laughs> And that happened. Thank note. you, everyone. <laughs>